You know, with this, uh, with the sanctions that they've put on Russia, I mean, you know, Biden came out and and said, you know, that the sanctions, you know, don't deter the anything, and yet they put these sanctions on, and inflation is skyrocketing. It was going up before then, and now it's it's out of control. Well. And, it, it, it was going to be out of control anyway. I mean, now I think they have a convenient scapegoat where they can blame it all on Putin. Uh, but, you know, Putin, you can blame Putin for a lot of things, but U.S. inflation is not one of them. Uh, we're creating the inflation ourselves. It's the U.S. government. It's the U.S. Federal Reserve. And, you know, I don't condone uh, what Putin is doing, but I do think the sanctions are going to backfire, which is usually the case with whatever government does. I don't think they're going to achieve their desired objective. Uh, but I think they are going to ultimately weaken uh, the U.S. economy even further and ultimately put into jeopardy the dollar's role as the reserve currency even sooner than what otherwise would have been the case. I mean, I think the dollar was on its way out as a global reserve currency, but we just gave it a bit of a push, and maybe the rest of the world will give up on the dollar sooner rather than later. Well, you know, now that China, you know, China won't come out against Russia and the two of them are uniting more and more and India won't come out against Russia either. And when you're looking at China, you know, one of my sayings is that the 20th century was the American century and the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century because the business of America has been war and the business of China is business. And they refuse to take a negative stance against uh, Russia. So do you see, you know, the, the yuan going much higher? Because it's, right now it, it, it counts a very little in, in, in global trade. Well, I think the Chinese currency is going to appreciate rather substantially against the U.S. dollar. And I think that's going to be very good for the Chinese people. It's going to be horrible for the United States because it's going to make Chinese goods dramatically more expensive for American consumers. So most American consumers will have to give up on, on, on those goods. We don't have the ability to produce the goods ourselves. It'll take a long time uh, for that to develop. But look, if you look at uh, China, Russia, and India, I mean, right there, you're close to half the world's population yep. just in those three countries. And you have tremendous economic productivity going on in those countries. You have China producing all these manufactured goods. You have tremendous resources uh, production out of Russia. And there's a lot going on in India as well. Uh, so, you know, they don't really need the rest of the world. I think those three countries could do very fine, even if they were isolated among themselves, which they won't be, because they'll also be trading with a lot of other parts of the world, uh, including South America, uh, Africa, other parts of Southeast Asia. So you really just have the United States, uh, Western Europe, and you know, maybe the rest of the former United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, those countries that you know, would, would kind of hold tight in this anti-Russia uh, sanction mode. But uh, you know, the rest of the world could do very well uh, without those countries. And the problem is, you know, we've got the big debts. We've got to borrow all this money. And the United States is completely dependent on the rest of the world for the production of the consumer goods uh, that, that, that make the economy work and that satisfy uh, individual needs. And so if we're gonna try to piss off and isolate ourselves from our biggest bankers and our biggest suppliers, we're, we're in for a world of hurt. And ultimately the sanctions could, be, could end up doing a lot more damage in the United States than they do in Russia. And by the way, the Russian ruble is actually higher now than it was when the sanctions were imposed. There was an initial 40% or so drop in the, in the ruble, but the ruble has recovered all those losses and is now higher than it was uh, when the sanctions were imposed in, in the day that they invaded Ukraine. You know, the, uh, well, going back to what you just said about the, uh, when you put together India and China and Russia, I mean, what are you looking at about uh, almost, what, 3 billion people, right? Yeah, I mean, it's better than 40%, closer to 50% of the population. I mean, China is the most populous uh, no nation, and then I think India is number two. Yeah. And, and they're huge. You know, you're talking about, you know, well over a billion people in each country. Right. But yeah, about 1.4 billion in each. And then you put, throw Russia in there. Yeah. And, and then you put together all of, you know, the United States and, and, and European countries. And you could throw in in Canada there. What do you have? About 800 million. And, and you know, you, 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 again, we go back to nothing is made here anymore. And we could thank 
I guess, who was the worst of that? Bill Clinton with NAFTA, and then it got brought well, it in China into the World Trade Organization? It was a NAFTA. You know, it, it's been declining for a long time, but the trade deficits really started to explode, I think, in, in the 1980s. But a lot of it was the result of going off the gold standard in the 1970s and getting to a position where we no longer had to produce stuff. We could just print money. Because when we were on the gold standard, we couldn't just print money because we had to mine gold first. Uh, but once we went off the gold standard and we could just create money out of thin air and then use that money to buy what everybody else produces, we started pr printing more and producing less and relying more and more heavily on the rest of the world. And that was also uh, an, an escape valve for American corporations because as we increased regulation and taxation, the way U.S. businesses were able to survive was to move all of their production offshore and to take advantage of what was then much cheaper labor in a regulatory environment that was a lot less costly. And so we were able to you know, you know, survive because of all that outsourcing. But now, of course, all those decisions are coming back to bite us because we've destroyed the comp productive capacity of the country. And now we're very vulnerable. You can look at what's going on with these global supply chains. And part of the problem is that whatever we want to buy first has to be shipped over here from China. And, and not only does it have to be shipped over from China and then unloaded on a port, let's say in California, but now everything has to be individually loaded up on trucks and sent to various parts of the country. You know, back when we produced our own stuff, we had factories all over the country. So stuff didn't have to come here on boats. And then a lot of the stuff that was produced was very close to the end consumer. But now if everything is showing up in Long Beach or Los Angeles and you've got to ship it all over the country, I mean, it's very expensive to distribute all the stuff that we import. And that goes back to inflation. Yeah, I mean, people forget that the inflation of the 1970s was rooted in the monetary policy and the big deficits of the 1960s. Yep. And, and so the inflation that we're going to experience in this decade that has just started is going to be far worse than anything that we experienced during the 1970s because the monetary and fiscal mistakes that were made this time are much bigger than the ones that were made last time. And in fact, if you look at year-over-year -year CPI, which the government claims to be about 8%, if we were measuring the CPI today using the same CPI index that we were measuring using during the 1970s, the CPI would be at least double what the government is reporting. So it's not 8%, it's 16%. And so by that measure, we are already experiencing inflation that is worse than any year of the 1970s or the early 1980s. And this is 2022. This decade is just getting started. Imagine how much higher inflation is going to be when we're nearing the end of the decade. You know, uh, in 1971, the uh, Treasury Secretary was um, John Connolly. That's the guy that also took the bullet in the yep. back sitting in front of JFK as a Democrat. And he wanted to meet me back in um, 1992 because in one of my books, Trend Tracking, I had forecast that um, there'd be a new third party and someone like Ross Perot would be the candidate. So I went down to Dallas. I have a photo of me, him, and his wife, Nellie, in front of the book depository, the first time back since the assassination. As we're working, walking back into the Anatole Hotel, he looks at me and he said, you know, I read your book. He says, it's a fine piece of work. He said, I know your heart's in the right place. He said, well, you don't have a clue what's going on. And neither do the American people, because if they did, there'd be a revolution in this country. Again, this is the guy that was the Treasury Secretary when they took us off the gold standard. And going back to what you talk about inflation, and again, these sanctions have escalated inflation across the globe. The emerging markets are being hit the hardest. Prices, you know, again, from palladium to to oil, and all across the board are going up. I want to talk and ask you about the interest rates. Mm -hmm. What do you think, how much do you think they're going to go up in the States? And what do you think the breaking point is going to be mm -hmm. when they get too high? Well, first of all, interest rates are going substantially higher from here. I mean, they're still much too low. We're now kind of approaching 3% yields on US Treasuries. We're not quite there yet. 
The yield on a two-year U.S. Treasury is about 2.75, and if you go out 30 years, you're about 2.6. So <laughs> we're still below three. But if you figure that inflation is eight, and that's what the government admits, as I said, it's at least double that. But if you just accept the government's version of inflation at 8%, why would you loan money to the U.S. government for 30 years at 3%? I mean, you're losing 5% per year to inflation. Your, your, your principal is being eroded in value, and you're not being compensated for that at all on the coupon. Interest rates need to be much higher than the rate of inflation. You know, in 1980, Volcker had short-term rates up to 20%. The highest inflation got in 1980 was 13.5%. So you had a huge gap there between the interest rate and the inflation rate, so there were very strong positive real interest rates. We still have historically low negative interest rates. The Fed is continuing to fuel the inflation fire uh, by holding interest rates artificially low. Even though they're raising them, they're raising them slowly. And even if they raise them by in 50 basis points clips, that's still too slow. I think that if the Fed follows through with its threat to shrink its balance sheet, and that really is a threat, because if the Fed shrinks its balance sheet, bond prices are going to implode because that means the Federal Reserve is now competing with the U.S. Treasury. The Treasury has to unload two and a half trillion worth of bonds this year. If the Federal Reserve is going to unload another trillion or trillion and a half, you got four trillion worth of low yielding treasuries looking for buyers. And by the way, the Social Security so-called trust funds, they're now selling treasuries too because they're running at deficits. So, the, the government is trying to unload trillions and trillions of low yielding bonds in a high inflationary environment. Bond prices have to collapse, interest rates have to skyrocket, and that's going to wreak havoc in the stock market, in the real estate market, the entire US economy, because thanks to the Fed, everybody is loaded up with debt. The government is loaded up with debt on all levels, federal, state, local, corporations, households. Everybody has been gorging on debt thanks to artificially low interest rates, which made that debt appear manageable based on how low the servicing costs were. Well, all of a sudden, the interest costs skyrocket on all this adjustable rate or short-term debt, and now debt that was manageable is completely unaffordable, and that means the debtors default, and we know what happens then. We saw that movie you know, in 2008, only the sequel is going to be even worse, which is generally the case right, with sequels, and you're going to see a bigger wave of defaults and bankruptcies and foreclosures in this financial crisis, which again will be much worse than the last one because it's also going to be a currency crisis. We're going to have massive inflation at the same time we have the financial crisis. When do you think the breakout point, like the latest data is showing that, uh, what, uh, new mortgage applications are down like 40% or something, and, and the markets are starting to take a hit. When do you think, what, before I go further, the, the IMF says that I believe interest rates should be at least 1% above the inflation rate. So that would mean if we're at 8% now, the, infla the, the, the interest rate should be 1% above inflation. So our interest rates should be now at least, what, 9%. Yeah, well, I would, I would want more than 1% above inflation because that's not a good enough return. I mean, 1% No, but I'm return? just saying, <laughs> yeah. you know, even what they're saying, yeah. and, and then you take not only the United States, but the ECB. I mean, you've got negative interest rates over there. Well, there's negative interest rates everywhere. I think they're the most negative here because we've actually got the highest inflation. So even though we have higher nominal rates uh, than what you would find in Europe or Japan, we have lower real rates because our inflation rate inflation. is higher. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, that's the unofficial, the real inflation rate or the official one, the real one is, is, is quite a bit higher than that. But look, when, when mortgage rates go up and now they're back up to about 5%, right. and historically that's still low, yeah. but in recent years, they've been well below four. I mean, we were, people were getting mortgages yeah, below three and a half percent on 30 year fix. And you know, if you look at home prices, you know, because they're up like 20% year over year, home prices are at record highs 
and home affordability is at a record low, yep. and that's before interest rates go up. So the only thing that's keeping these overpriced homes marginally affordable is the low mortgage rates. But if you take away those low mortgage rates and mortgage rates move back up to maybe seven, eight, nine percent, which is was normal, you know, before the 08 financial crisis, we get mortgage rates back there. Something's got to give. Oh, yeah. Other way, otherwise, nobody can afford to buy a house. And what's going to give are the home prices. Home prices are going to crash. But what's not going to happen, though, is new construction because inflation is driving the cost of, of building new homes through the roof. So we're not going to get any new homes. If you want a home, you're going to have to buy one of the homes that already exists. Uh, but you know, if you, if you don't have any money and somebody wants to sell you a house, I mean, the price is going to have to go down. At some point, real estate could become an all-cash market because most people may not even be able to qualify for a mortgage. Yeah. But when do you think, what, what inflation rate, do you, uh, uh, interest rate do you think, when the Fed gets it, goes to, that it's really going to bring down the markets and the economy? Well, I think we're already there. I mean, I think the market's already broke. And we just haven't collapsed yet, but I think we're headed lower. The bond market clearly broke. Uh, but if you go back to 2018, the wheels really came off the bus in the fourth quarter of 2018. I remember. The Fed got rates up to about two and a quarter, two and a half, and then they had to stop hiking. And then they had to stop quantitative tightening, and they ultimately went back to zero in QE in March of 2020 with COVID as the excuse. This time around, I think the breaking point is much lower than what it was in 2018, because the breaking point is a function of how much debt you have. So the more debt you have, the bigger the impact and increase in interest rates is, and the lower the increase has to be to create that impact. So because we have so much more debt now than we did before COVID, the economy is more levered up and more dependent on cheap money as that money becomes less cheap, uh, you're going to have a collapse quicker. It's like we have a much bigger drug ha hub habit now. Yeah. And because this drug habit is so much bigger, we're going to go into a relapse and withdrawal much sooner e with an even smaller uh, reduction in the dose of our, of our you know, monetary heroin, which is what, where, we're going, where we're headed. So I don't even know if the Fed's going to get to 1% before everything crashes. Wow. I mean, right wow. now we're at a quarter of 1%. Yeah. So one more 50, 150 basis point rate hike, that might do it, you know?